It's a, a great honour to be here. Um, I love being with families. Uh, my practice is very much in this space. And as I've got old, so have some of my patients. So about a third of my patients are now adults. So even though I trained as a paediatric epilepsy specialist. So I live and breathe this journey. I don't have my own child with LGS, but I certainly understand it. Um, and. Um, try and help with various concerns, though I wish I could fix the issues, and, and that's really where we want to um, go forward in time. I thought I'd start with a, a thank you and, a, and warmest wishes from Australia. This is our meeting last Saturday, actually, called uh, Run by Parents, um, and the team they've put together, they call themselves GETA, Genetic Epilepsy Team Australia. Now, you don't have to have a gene diagnosis to fit in this space, you just basically I have to have a, a severe epilepsy is how it fits together. And um, this is the team. They brought out Dan Lowenstein, who you can see here, um, for the meeting. And it really is very science-oriented about how we're going to take the field forward. One of the things I, I marvel at is it's what I call the most amazing parents, and I'm sure that's exactly what this organisation is about as well, the most amazing parents set up organisations like this. And you are the guys that are going to change the world uh, with us. And, uh, you know, I think without you, we, we really got nowhere to go, so it's, it's fantastic. I wanted to thank Tracy, who I've known for a long time, and Christina as well for the invitation to be here and everyone at LGSF because I think um, it's uh, really important. So when I trained, which was far too long ago to mention how long, this is what we thought about when we thought about Lennox Gastro Syndrome. It was uh, helmet epilepsy, when you're wearing a helmet to protect yourself against these nasty drop attacks. And here you see a little guy uh, that I've looked after now. He's about 27 or something, and you can see he's having lots of drop attacks. He's got uh, uh, scar... Uh, bruises here from the drop attacks. There's no one home. He's in non-convulsive status epilepticus. Here he's in a better patch where he's with us. He's, the lights are on, someone's at home. He's got this nasty, well, it looks like a really cute dimple, but it's from an injury from a drop attack, so it's not as cute as it looks. So that's what I was, when I started, that's what we, we thought of as Lennox Gastro Syndrome. Um, I thought I'd go into now how we use the term Lennox Gastro Syndrome, which is much more pure than just um, the drop attack helmet epilepsy. I'm going to go in and use and spend some time talking about the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, which is squarely where Lennox Gastro Syndrome fits and then talk about how the genes interrelate to that, because they're different and complementary, but not the same deal. And then spend a bit of time talking about diverse causes and outcomes. But, but you've got a lot more talks on genetics. I'm not going to focus on it too much, but use it just to give a big picture and to say how understanding a gene affects your approach, but not in a, in a huge amount of detail. So uh, here you see Lennox and Gasto, after whom the uh, syndrome is caused, and they described a severe disabling epilepsy. Um, and we heard yesterday it's in about 3% of patients with epilepsy begins in childhood. A third of children have had preceding infantile spasms. And one of the very uh, hallmarks of this was the developmental regression, or going backwards. And here is one of the adults in our, that we look after at our hospital with the crash helmet epilepsy. And here is his cause, which is a major malformation of brain development. So what are the hallmarks? How do I, what do I need to make a diagnosis of Lennox Gastro syndrome? Well, there are basically four points. And here you see a little five-year-old uh, who has, and now we have found just recently, he's now about 15, the diagnosis is MBD5, is his gene. And he has this classical tonic seizure, which is the hallmark of Lennox Gastro syndrome. And here is a rare uh, thing to actually capture where the tonic seizure is going into a tonic clonic. Often with Lennox Gastro children and adults, they just have tonic seizures, that's their most frequent, but occasionally they'll go into a tonic clonic. And it has this very classical EEG that we see during the tonic seizure. 
So number one is tonic seizures. The second part of a diagnosis is um, atypical absence epilepsy. And here's a 32-year-old young lady that I looked after. She died recently. And she has about eight year day where her parents actually uh, tell you that she's having an absence. And interestingly, she puts her head to the side and it correlates beautifully with the slow spark wave activity. And she does this 80 times a day. The third thing uh, is the EEG feature of slow spike wave, and this is very dramatic. These are one second marks, and here you have every second there's a discharge, and that's what slow spike wave looks like. It's quite different to spike wave that you see in absence epilepsy. And then the fourth feature is this generalised paroxysmal fast activity. Now, when I trained, that wasn't made such a big thing of, but now uh, people uh, feel that is part of the syndrome. And so you basically have to have these four features to have a diagnosis of lennox gastro syndrome. If the patient has never had slow spike wave, then they have another form of developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. But they also have a lot more, as you well know. And if you have a look here, they can have many other seizure types, tonic-clonic seizures. The old-fashioned old name for that is grand mal. Atonic seizures, where you have loss of tone and you suddenly crash to the ground. Many, and I think more than we recognise, have still go, are still having epileptic spasms. So you can go from infantile spasms into Lennox-Gastro syndrome, but many still keep these regular spasms that may happen at the end of a tonic-clonic seizure or may happen on their own. And, and often we only pick them up in admission when we're monitoring the child or adult because they're so subtle they haven't been recognised. Parents might know they're there or they may have been called myoclonic seizures um, they often have focal seizures. I'm sorry for my shortening there. Uh, that's talking about status epilepticus, which is defined as a seizure lasting more than 30 minutes. And that can be convulsive status epilepticus, where you have convulsions that continue for 30 minutes, or the person has so many in a row and doesn't come out of it between the convulsions. That's convulsive status epilepticus. And the NCSE refers to non-convulsive status epilepticus. And that's often where it's very common in LGS where the child or adult is just not with you. They're steery, they may be dribbly, uh, they may be more unsteady than usual. They're just not there for a few hours and you know they're not quite right. That's called non-convulsive status epilepticus. Again, a sad Sadly, very common for LGS. So how does LGS relate to all the other syndromes? Well, we have a whole host of syndromes in the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, and that's what I'm going to walk you through in a moment. You've heard of Dravet and West, or uh, infantile spasms, it's also known as uh, myoclonic atonic epilepsy, or some people call it Dozer or Deuce syndrome. But there are others, and they're rarer still, Otahara, uh, epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures, and the, the ones we stop speaking, the epilepsy aphasia syndromes, landau kleffner syndrome is the best known. But wait, there are more. There are focal ones. So you, have, um, you can have them start with a focal uh, problem, such as a hypothalamic hematoma or uh, tuberous sclerosis, and they can go into these syndromes, or Rasmussen syndrome. But there are lots and lots of children and adults who don't fit into a syndrome, and this is a real problem in the field. They're in the sea of blue, I'm showing you. And uh, they can begin under three months of age. They can begin in infancy, between three months and two years. But in fact, they can begin at any age. So even in adult life, you can develop, a developmental, or you can develop an epileptic encephalopathy. So what do we mean by this? long-term epileptic encephalopathy, and you'll hear that a lot nowadays. Um, and we're really referring to this, which is an LGS EEG of slow spike wave with the discharges every second. And with an epileptic encephalopathy, the meaning is that the epileptic activity is going on all the time. And if you like, it's hammering that brain so the poor person cannot learn because they have this constant epileptic activity. And that's what's going in this whole group of diseases. And Lennox-Gastro syndrome is really one of the best known of these uh, 
developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. So the, ter the definition from the International League Against Epilepsy, and this is from the commission that Anne Berg le led in 2010, is that the epileptic activity itself contributes to learning and behavioural problems beyond that expected from the actual pathology of the brain alone. So you might have just a, a small malformation of the brain, but the, that's generating this whole epileptic process and the person can't learn. So I've tried to think about how can I get this to be a little bit clearer. And I'm thinking, well, it's really three components that go together. A triad of seizures, epileptic activity, and impact on development. So with the seizures, most of the children have very frequent seizures, not always, but with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, our patients have loads and loads of seizures, as you well know. They typically have many seizure types. The seizures may big, begin all at once, kabang, over a few days the child was normal, suddenly they're having a whole lot of seizures. Or it may be very gradual, such as in Dravet syndrome, often it sort of builds up over time. In some of the developmental or the epileptic encephalopathies, you can have just a single seizure type, and a, a one of those is absence seizures with eyelid myoclonias, where you see children have eyelid fluttering all day long, and they really can't learn because of this constant epileptic activity. But seizures are not always present, and the example of that is landau kleffner syndrome. So what about this epileptic activity? It's constantly hammering the brain, but it comes in many shapes and sizes, and we have very distinctive patterns that we as EEG doctors like to recognise, and we go, oh, that's this or that's that. And probably the best known is hypsarrhythmia, which goes with infantile spasms, but slow spike wave is the one that is the LGS one, and, and this hypsarrhythmia often goes into slow spike wave. But there are many patients, as I've said, that are in that blue sea and don't fit into a syndrome. They often have very frequent multifocal discharges, which means discharges coming from all over the brain at different times. This may differ in when it appears, what age, and how much is there. So there's lots of ways of looking at this. Uh, but sometimes people say to me, oh, my child, or not people, really, I'll give an, ex a, an example. We've just run a genetics research project and asked neurologists from around Australia to send in patients to have exome sequencing for, I think, it was 105 children. And um, they referred some patients who'd never had epileptic activity. If you've never had epileptic activity, then you don't have an epileptic activity encephalopathy. I think that's, it sounds obvious, but it's not always immediately obvious. So the third component is the impact on development. In some children with an epileptic encephalopathy, development was completely normal and then bang, it started. They got these multiple types of seizures and their development usually slows and often also goes backwards, which is heartbreaking. Um, and it can happen all at once, or it can happen in a stepwise manner. So every time the child has maybe a prolonged seizure, an episode of status epilepticus, or sometimes just a short, short seizure, the child goes backwards. Or in lennox gastro maybe a cluster of drop attacks. So what triggers the developmental slowing? Well, the most common thing is seizures, but it's not always that. Sometimes it can be a nasty illness, like a pneumonia, or sometimes uh, it can be brain edema, brain swelling, which we've described in uh, some of the children with Dravet syndrome. So here's the same idea, but in picture. Here's a little girl, and I'll come back to her a bit later. When I met her, she was having seizures, tonic seizures, as you can see here, every five minutes. She had constant epileptic activity, and so that's your second. And then these two together typically produce developmental slowing or regression. So the idea here is, is that you have this encephalopathy, a disorder of the brain, which has an epileptic basis, and that can occur at any age. So why does it all matter? Why are we so focused on that? Well, the reason for that is that perhaps there's something you can do about it. And one of the most straightforward examples is where you have a structural abnormality of the brain. And if you do epilepsy surgery, you can remove that part of the brain. Now, I have to say that's not the case for probably 
Now, 80 to 90, 90% of patients with LGS. But if it happens to be the case for your patient, for your child, then that really makes a difference. So here you see an MRI of somebody who has tuberous sclerosis. So it's a cut through the brain at this sort of angle. And you can see here lots and lots of tubers, which are these malformations of the brain that are classical for tuberous sclerosis. If we see that MRI, we know immediately we're dealing with tuberous sclerosis. And why does that matter? Because we know that one of those tubers, like one of these patches here, might be the one causing most of that child's seizures. And um, lots of surgery is being done to remove tubers now, and some very innovative surgery, like just moving the, removing the centre of, of the tuber is occurring in Melbourne by one of my colleagues. And that can actually stole, sorry, stop this process. So it actually stops this whole epileptic encephalopathy, and the child normally gets on with their development. So that's why it really matters. And it matters to pick it early, which is why an MRI, a high quality epilepsy MRI matters. But that's not all. Sometimes if you know the gene for your child's LGS, it can make a real difference. So for example, if you have Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, we know there are some drugs that are good for Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Though you can never say something is good for every child because there will always be one where it's not so good. But I've written here Lennox-Gastaut syndrome drugs we tend to think about, uh, uh, Valproid or Adepakosh, Lamotrigine, Topiramate, Clobazam, and there are hosts more. But then we also know that if you know the gene, it might take you to another level. You might be able to say, well, this drug is usually not so good in these guys. I won't use Keppra. It makes them all very um, ratty, or I might use Keppra because it's a really good drug for this gene. So you need to know. And if you can improve seizure control, as you mostly know, I'm sure from your own experience, the child's development improves. They're more able to learn, they're more able to, you see gains straight away with the right drug, and you see if the wrong drug makes seizures worse, that the child goes backwards. So getting that right is a really important process, and one that I work on continuously with my family. So it's a process, it doesn't happen overnight. But in the most recent um, classification of the epilepsies, we developed, we changed this a little bit more to introduce the term developmental. And that's because we recognise that the genes causing these disorders, or the not necessarily genes, the malformations or the damage to the brain, often causes developmental problems in its own right, not just the epileptic encephalopathy. What happens is you then get your epileptic encephalopathy process superimposed on the slow development. So a child has normal, abnormal development, you get the epileptic encephalopathy on top of that, and there may be something you can fix simply by knowing the right drugs for that child. We're moving from this complex term to a gene name encephalopathy, but I don't want you to feel that the, the term Lennox-Gastaut syndrome needs to go. I think it's highly complementary, and they're telling us different things, and I'm hoping through this talk you'll see why. Importantly, when you understand the child's disease a bit more, you actually can then start to look for their comorbidities, or that means other associated disorders, which are really critical because they may be more of an issue for your lives, such as your uh, child or adult's gait, their walking problems, or their behavioural problems. And one of the things is that even though we might get the seizures completely under control, they may melt away, as in this little boy uh, with KCNQ2 encephalopathy. His seizure stopped when he was two. But here he is at four, and he's profoundly impaired. So this KCNQ2 is doing a lot more damage than just the epileptic encephalopathy. It's the KCNQ2, which is a potassium channel gene. It's that gene abnormality that's causing this profound impairment. So we realised that there was more than just a gene causing an epileptic encephalopathy. There's also a gene causing developmental problems. And then when we think about the comorbidities, these disorders, I'm trying to turn myself off, but I can't, I'm afraid. These gene disorders often keep company with a lot of movement disorders. So here you see um, a stereotypy, it's called, a figure of eight 
stereotypy and dyskinetic or abnormal movements of this young man's, or he's about six, this boy's hands. And here are two other different types of movement disorders. The little girl has got um, cerebellar features, unsteadiness, a completely different type of movement disorder to the first child. And she's higher functioning, as you can see. And the little one on the right has got a hyperkinetic movement disorder, very rapid. And they are all associated with different genes. So we know that specific genes may produce different patterns of movement disorders. Now, often the movement disorders, we don't treat that actively. And we don't necessarily want the child to have more drugs. But the little guy on the right has such a profound movement disorder that he's impossible to, to nurse. And the parents really have trouble. And they come from Canberra to see me to Melbourne. It's about, oh. 500 kilometres, I don't know whether it's miles, 300 miles, 200 miles, Katie, tell me. And um, they, um, they can't travel now with the, their brother and a sister, they can't travel with their brother on the aeroplane now because he's just, his movements are too difficult. So movement disorders are something we're increasingly recognising. But the epilepsy, and I'm sure, I don't need to tell you this, it's just the tip of the iceberg. These other associated features, the comorbidities, are also incredibly important. And one as we as your physicians need to focus on. And, and there are a whole host of different ones. Um, and I haven't even labelled there ones that become an issue in adult life. Uh, which uh, we're now beginning to understand that there are different issues that can arise in adult life that we need to worry about as well. So um, I'm sure these are all things you worry about, but I think we as your doctors need to worry about them with you and try and figure out treatments that can improve quality of life. So back to uh, my little C here, and just to emphasise that lennox gastro syndrome is a very important player in the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, but I wanted to show you where it fits in here. And I think, I was talking with Tracy before, and I think there are so many people in this C that are going through exactly what you're talking about, my blue C, and it would be wonderful if you can embrace them into your uh, organisation, and Tracy assures me you absolutely do. And um, I think it is really critical because they're facing the same dilemmas. And if you don't fit in a syndrome or you don't have a gene, where do you fit? Well, this is a perfect place, and um, I think the support families give each other, nothing else is, is in some ways as good, I think. So then let me move on to the next thing, which is that the epilepsy syndrome doesn't equate to a genetic epilepsy. And these are very different ideas. One's about cause. Both are important. Both have their place. And both affect treatment and management. So um, you have a gene. And most of the genes we're not, not most, but I would say maybe half the genes we know have two sort of spe have a spectrum of disease. They have self-limited or what we used to call benign epilepsies, and they also cause these developmental and epileptic encephalopathies that I've been talking about. But this spectrum is along here, and we often recognise it by one end. So, for example, Dravet syndrome was recognised by Charlotte Dravet down here at the severe end. The self-limited epilepsy is the same gene, SCM1A, can cause febrile seizures or GEFs plus, which is something that came from our work. And, and yet there are also ones in the middle that don't fit. So once you find a gene, it suddenly explodes. It goes from this sort of syndromology to these. But not everything, not everything fits in there. And that's where understanding the presentation, and we use the word phenotype, and understanding the gene and bringing them together is critical. And that's where you need your doctors to work, your neurologists, paediatricians, geneticists all to work together. So let's just take an example. One gene can cause many syndromes. So if we take SCN2A, which is a different sodium channel gene, turning out to be very important in this world. It causes a rare, um, very mild epilepsy, runs in families. The name of the syndrome is benign familial neonatal infantile seizures. Rare, you, you're normal, outcome's normal, you grow out of it. It's not nice at the time, but it's uh, very mild. But it also causes developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. Does it cause one? No, it causes a host of different ones, including LGS. But then if you look the other way around and you take LGS, I didn't even begin to populate this fully, and I'm sure there are people whose children have other genes here, but there are many genes 
uh, for LGS, um, and you'll hear more about that from Katie Hilbig and, and Heather Method. But just to say one syndrome causes many genes, so different concepts, both useful. What about the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies? Well, there are more than 100 different genes, and what's this picture of? It's meant to be a neuron, a nerve cell in the brain, meeting another one, and this is called a synapse. Each of these little set of letters refers to a different gene. So this is from a review we did back in 2015 when there were 60 genes, there are now well over 100, I've stopped counting. And what do these different genes do? a host of different processes, but they're involved in fixing your DNA where there are problems, they're involved in making proteins, and these, each of these circles relates to a different protein, they're involved in modifying those proteins, so making them right, fit for purpose if you like. They're involved here in the iron channel gates, the little gateways into the cell not working, or they're involved here in the actual synapses not working. So one of the beauties about finding a cause for your child's LGS is the next step. You can then understand that cause and hone in on the mechanism. What's going wrong in my child's brain? What can we do to fix it? And one of the things that I think is a very exciting space is that we get family groups for each different gene, uh, for every genetic disease. And I've just put up some of the um, the different groups for, there are many, there are often several per gene, which I'm not sure is that helpful, but I think it's great that the families are leading the way. And I think if I was a parent of a child or an adult with LGS, I would be very much in the space of being affiliated with both. I'd want to know what's happening next in LGS world, and I'd want to know what's happening next in my gene world, because they're different information. And as I've just shown you, one gene can cause many different syndromes. So I just have one slide really on the causes of LGS. I suspect you're going to hear lots about this and have already, but you can have brain malformations and here's a, a nice juicy hypothalamic hematoma. I put that on up because it's one that might benefit from surgery. You can have an acquired thing and here is acquired cause such as infection or tumour, but often uh, a stroke for example, and this is uh, one of the patients with a stroke. Um, you can have one of these many genes we talked about, but we still have quite a lot, and I'm sure there are some in this room, where you don't know the cause. Should you give, give up and move on? Absolutely not. You should never stop looking. Once you've got that cause, that means you can sign off on this as the cause. I know it wasn't this that I did. It was just bad luck, and that's very, very likely. It was nothing you did. It was purely bad luck. So I just thought I'd show you um, a tiny, tiny example from the genetics literature. This is a very nice European paper on this SCN2A, the alpha-2 subunit. Here you see the SCN2A gene uh, makes a protein, an alpha subunit, which is part of a sodium channel, SCN2A. Sorry, encodes a sodium channel. And this is the subunit, this is the cell membrane, and these little arrows are where the sodium ions pass. So this is like into a little gateway into the cell. We all have them in all our cells in our body. And when this goes wrong, you get a whole host of different syndromes. And here you see in this large study, which was European, but also reviewed all the literature, they showed 3% of SCN2A encephalopathy. Children and adults have Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And they also showed all these other syndromes. But why does that matter? They then broke it down by response. And this is just response, this isn't a, a proper formalised study, it's going back on all the history on about 60 patients. And they broke them into those that began under three months of age. And there the abnormality of SCN2A meant the channel over functions, it was too good at its job. And if you began after three months, the channel didn't function well at all, it was lousy at its job. And so then they looked at response to a specific drug, and here are a whole lot of drugs, and they looked at those that were seizure-free in the dark purple and no, no effect. And they found that if you had the very early onset, under three months, the sodium channel blockers such as phenytoin and carbamazepine uh, actually worked really well. On the other hand, if you had the gain of function, like the Lennox-Gastaut children would have done, and you began, uh, sorry, the loss of function, and began after three months, like the LGS patients would have done, these drugs were bad for you. 
So just by even knowing your SCN2A cause and knowing your syndrome, it helps you to start to figure out which drugs might help at a very simple matter, level. So how does this make a difference? Understanding the cause guides therapy already today, but has the promise of precision medicine tomorrow. So if you know the cause of your child's epilepsy, then you may be in that rare group that is suitable for epilepsy surgery. I've mentioned hypothalamic hematoma, but you could have even just a small region of brain that's not formed correctly, which we call focal cortical dysplasia. It could be that you have a tuber that's causing all the seizures in tuberous sclerosis. So that may make you a surgical candidate. But what's very exciting and was touched on yesterday is this issue of precision medicine. And precision medicine is where you actually know the gene that's gone wrong, you can target that abnormality, and you can make a difference to the child's development. Now, at the moment, this is largely hope, but that hope is finally becoming something that we can feel. It's, it's happening, and it's already happening in other diseases, uh, such as Batten's disease, where I have a patient who's having replacement enzyme into their brain, and this child isn't dying, and that is really exciting. And in order to be ready for those gene therapy trials, we need natural history studies, which you heard about yesterday. So precision medicine is the hope, but it can be done in a myriad of ways, so it's not just one thing. You can do this many ways, and I think we have to be open to all those many ways. So what about current treatment? Well, it's empirical, which means it's based on knowledge and experience. And so we know these drugs are good for LGS, and these drugs can make LGS worse. And what about trials? Well, I think trials are critical, and these are the gold standard. And as we've seen, we've had trials of CBD already uh, for LGS, uh, rifinamide, and other drugs. And this is absolutely what we have to be doing if we're going to get proper, proper answers to whether the, the medicine you're investing in for your child actually makes a difference for them. And if we don't do trials, we're not doing our job. So it's really important for the clinicians to be involved in trials and really important for us to offer them to you, but to offer them to you in a balanced way. With, and the beauty of a trial is your child is watched very carefully, they're seen often, they're having lots of assessments. And I think trials are really important to move it forward. They're a huge amount of work for you and for us, but really important. And we've got to think again about how we approach trials. What are we treating? Are we treating just seizures? No, we want to treat development. We want to treat sleep. We want to treat behaviour. We want to treat, we want to make sure that they don't develop psychosis when they get older. We want to develop, make sure they don't have depression. So we want to think much more broadly than just about seizures. And um, we've got to remember in LGS, it's treating a group of diseases, which is all about the cause. But that doesn't matter as long as we know that LGS is LGS and it's been correctly diagnosed. So where are we at? We're at this urgent clinical need. There's no doubt with anyone in this room that we have an urgent <laughs> clinical need. We're getting increasing genetic knowledge, and that's through all this new gene sequencing, which is so exciting, because suddenly we're solving people. And you know, I'm solving probably patients I've looked after for 20, 30 years now. You know, once a month at least, I'm speaking to one of my parents. I rang up a 70-year-old the other day and said to her 35-year-old, hey, Helen, you won't know what I've got to tell you. And she said, oh, I didn't think I'd hear that in my lifetime. And yeah, it's not going to change her 35-year-old's life that much, but it changes her parents' life because she knows the answer. And um, when you actually get this girl's gene or woman's gene and you look at the paper, perfect match. The face is exactly the right face. So it's about, you know, I mean, this is it really important. But then we go from, from getting a gene answer is the beginning of your answer. It's not the end of your answer. You then go on to understand disease mechanism. Um, and then you work with your basic scientists, your laboratory scientists, to drill down and to understand what's going wrong. Why has this gene abnormality made this protein not work? What can we do to fix this protein? Then they can test on the cells, on the zebrafish, on the mice, 
new drugs or repurposed drugs, but then we as clinicians have to be ready to then trial them in the patients um, to then see if they work. And once proper trials, and by that I mean double-blind, randomised, placebo-controlled trials, once we show they work, then implementing it, getting it out there for everyone for whom it's appropriate. And this is the end point, the improved outcomes. So um, I had put aside some time for questions, but I decided I was told that I had 45 minutes and I could speak through the whole 45 minutes. So I just put a little bit in about classification because I wanted to show you again how this all relates to the new classification. Um, and we had a classification that brought out a framework and new seizure types. And um, this is the new classification from 2017 where we start with seizure types which are broken into focal onset generalised onset and unknown focal beginning in one part of your brain, generalised beginning uh, in both sides of the brain and unknown meaning, pretty obvious, unknown. Um, and, but from the moment we see a child or an adult with epilepsy, we need to think about what's the cause? Why has this person had a seizure? And we have all these uh, groupings, but there are more, but these are the ones that are most important for treatment. We then go from seizure types to epilepsy types. And uh, we brought in a new one, which was combined, generalised and focal. And this really is very appropriate for lennox gasto syndrome because it is usually a combined, generalised and focal. Um, and many of the children and adults will have multiple seizure types. So in LGS, we know that they may have focal seizures, they may have absence seizures, they may have tonic-clonic seizures. They often they have to have tonic seizures, as I've mentioned. But then we also, in many but not all patients, can make an epilepsy syndrome diagnosis. And so um, this is the classification framework and we also wanted to emphasise all the way along that other features are present, that many patients with epilepsy have these other comorbidities, but the learning problems or the depression, etc. So let's just apply that then to this little girl and you see her, I showed her at the beginning in a tonic seizure and she had a very active abnormal EEG with slow spike wave uh, and she has a diagnosis of lennox gasto syndrome. So did we find the cause? Yes, we found that she has SCN2A encephalopathy. And so what about her comorbidities? Well, I met her at the age of 21 months. We got her a lot better with sodium channel blockers but a month later, she had sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. So I just wanted to show that we can apply this new framework. Now, where the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies fit, they fit across here, and they're not quite the same as this framework, but the concepts are really important, and many of the patients, as I've said to you, are in that sea of blue. So let's get back to Lennox-Gasto syndrome. This are the minimum uh, of four things, the tonic, uh, seizures, atypical absence, slow spike wave, uh, and generalised paroxysmal fast activity. Um, the genetic epilepsies um, mean something different, but genes cause lennox gasto syndrome. But just because you get a gene doesn't tell you immediately are they going to have a mild self-limited epilepsy or a severe epilepsy, and that's where your uh, doctor and, and you need to work together to understand where your child fits. So to conclude, Lennox Gasto syndrome is always an epileptic encephalopathy. It's often a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. I think it's an incredibly helpful syndrome, even as we move on to genetic diseases. It's quite different to the idea of a genetic encephalopathy, though the two obviously overlap. And genetic epilepsies have a spectrum for most genes. Not all are nasty encephalopathies, some are mild. Um, and lennox gasto syndrome diagnosis is critical for you to be able to target treatments and to be able to be involved in treatment trials and to take you forward. And just to close, thank you, Tracy, again, for the opportunity to be here with you all. Um, this is the fabulous group of people I work with. We've had an re annual retreat every year where we go away and just live and breathe epilepsy. Can you think anything better? <laughs> and being in Seattle, I wanted to particularly uh, note my fantastic collaborators in Seattle. I've worked with Heather Mefford's team for about 10 years. It's been one of the most... Uh, wonderful collaborations of my life and um, also many other people around the world that I've uh, very fortunate to collaborate with. Thank you very much.